Hello, anthropologists. We're continuing with subsistence patterns today. We're going into horticulture, agriculture, and once you have the agricultural systems, those patterns of exchange become much larger and we start to work on symbolic systems of currency, of market economy. So we're going to be discussing some of that. Remember last week we discussed foragers, um, hunter-gatherers who had a semi-egalitarian or an egalitarian society which everybody in the community shared what they had and everybody received what they needed. That is generalized reciprocity, just like in a family. In a market exchange system, we have something called balanced reciprocity. Like Plain Settlers of Catan, I'll give you wood for sheep, or I have grain and I need minerals, so I'll trade. That's balanced reciprocity. It's what you get during um, your secret Santa gift exchange in the offices. So that's how we're going to end this discussion is with that balanced and generalized reciprocity discussion. Okay, horticulturalist and agriculturalist are sedentary. Well, horticulturalists tend to work in a semi-defined area. They'll work a bit of land for a couple of years and when it stops being mineral dense enough to grow the plants the way they want it, they'll use slash and burn or swidden horticulture. They'll cut down the trees They'll burn the tree um, ribbons to the ground and it's nice fertile soil. And then when they're done with it, it returns to nature. So slash and burn sounds really devastating, but if you look at it, it's pretty sustainable. So they're semi-sedentary and agricultural communities, they're locked and tied to that land. They'll farm the same bit of land for generation after generation after generation. With pastoralists, they're mostly nomadic and foragers have to be nomadic to follow their food sources. So I'm going to read the definition here. Sedentary is a human settlement pattern in which people largely stay in one place year round. Of course, you're going to get people moving about hunting. You're going to get people looking for raw materials. You're going to get traveling um, salesmen, traders, merchants. But for the most part, the majority of the population is tied to that land. So horticulture, our society is found using human labor. They don't tie up their pigs, because many of them have pigs or different animals, but they don't tie them to plows. The farming that is done is using simple human labor. They'll have machetes, they'll have digging sticks. So they live in rich areas where all you really got to do is put the plant in the ground, Make sure animals don't eat the plant and you're good to go. After a few months, they pull this plant out and then they process it into food. Another very important thing that defines horticultural people from agricultural people is who gets the produce of their farming. For the horticultural community, they make it for themselves, either their families or their village. They make a surplus to trade but that's just trading for prestige or to get goods that they would like. Agricultural communities, you're farming both for your own food and to either sell and more importantly, to use as taxes. So who gets the outcome of this produce? Okay, horticultural societies tend to live in tropical forests. There's sufficient rainfall abundant use of plant species, good weather. They don't need plows and fertilizer and all the work that goes into agriculture. So this is very rich land, whereas agriculture is on more marginal land. It's not bad as the pastoralists tend to live on, where it's really hard to grow stuff, but it also in agricultural communities doesn't tend to come as easy as where the horticultural societies live.
Okay. Foragers tend to live in smaller groups for the most part, give or take 30 people in a band. Horticultural communities can hold 50, 100 people. So because they're producing their own food, their land can support more people, they're more stable, and they live in the same area. So they're more sedentary. Many horticultural families are polygynous. And remember, marriage patterns and religious patterns tend to follow the subsistence patterns. Because they live off what they pick off of their produce, having many members of the family is really important. So there's more hands to pick the yucca or the manioc or the um, yams or whatever it is they eat. There's also more hands to go hunting and fishing and engage in subsistence pattern behaviors. So large families are considered blessings. Also, while they have an egalitarian outlook, the leader has more pigs or more wives or something that sets him to be slightly more rich than the other community members. It's not a permanent leadership position. And what's on earth is reflected in what's in heaven. So there's still a mostly egalitarian look in their belief systems. They're polytheistic for the most part. There is also some ancestor worship where they recognize that the spirits of their dead are there with them. There is minimal ownership. They have plants. They own some things, unlike the forger communities where there's very little ownership of anything at all and definitely not of land or large things. In these communities, you're going to see a lot of territorialism. The community will own that bit of land that they're farming, but they have to jealously guard against other communities trying to take their land. So there's systems of warfare back and forth in most of these horticultural communities. Of course, the state societies um, that dominate their geographic regions have for the most part put an end to the warfare. In New Guinea, they put in place um, Olympic style games or um, cricket matches that have been used to replace this intertribal warfare. If you get a chance, look up Trobriand Island Cricket. It's my favorite ethnographic video in which about 100, 120 years ago, give or take, the missionaries brought cricket down to the Trobriand Islands, down to New Guinea, to um, Australia. They introduced cricket. And they're like, okay, you've got to play this. This warfare has got to stop. And okay, we're getting punished for engaging in warfare. Fine. We'll try this cricket business. But instead of the small teams, I think it's nine people on a cricket team. Forgive me if I'm wrong. They decide, well, we have 40 warriors. We're going to play 40 men in this cricket match. And they do um, chants every time that there's a hit. There'll be a war chant that goes on. They'll use magic in shaping um, their bats when they're cutting them because they make their own bats and balls. They'll use magic in the decoration. And so it's very much that they've used this one thing that was legal to replace their cultural behavior that became illegal and it's a really neat um version of synchronism it's where you have one culture that's trying to replace another but the old culture is coming through so it's really cool okay so once again just to remind you the definition of horticulture is farming using human labor and simple tools so now we're going to agriculture which relies on 
at first animal labor and then mechanical labor and now we have this really intense form which is industrialization in which we completely have replaced humans with machines in this business you very rarely ever see a farmer with a sickle or a scythe or whatever actually reaping the grain so around the fertile crescent southwest asia area that's where you first see domestication first of animals first in the um pastoralist style where you have animals and then of course the grains from there and these are all separate areas of domestication that each independently um created it so that's kind of neat that it had separate origins in the new world in asia in africa it all developed independently give or take around the same couple thousand years and here if you want to look dogs domesticated easiest everywhere obviously um here the earliest domesticate in southwest asia was sheep cattle and then we get the grain food okay i've given you enough time moving on okay plant and animal domestication happened later in the new world and was never as extensive as in the old world um people got here later there were less available domesticatable organisms here and also it was a pretty rich abundant place to live as either hunter-gatherers or horticulturalists so intensive agriculture wasn't needed to support decent sized populations it wasn't until we had these huge state level societies starting to form that it was really really necessary to start with the maize um, agriculture okay here you can see the what we're pretty sure is where corn came from we believe it's from teosinte you can see how much smaller this part of the plant the sexual organ that produces the seeds is in the earlier forms compared to the domestic product and when we see this in the archaeological record we can see the progression of when people went from getting wild food sources to domesticated food sources and both plants and animals the organisms that are domesticated look very different than their wild form the bones of the animals are different also the sex of the animals you tend to get a more homogenized group of animals that are being killed for food as opposed to hunted where you get random ages and sexes of the animals that you're going to find that have been eaten okay we also find um archaeological evidence in the form of the tools that are being used foragers aren't going to have the same tools for processing food or getting food that you're going to find in horticultural or agricultural communities um foragers don't rely on grains i mean they'll eat these wild grain plants but for the most part they're going to have a larger variety of food whereas you see this um mortar and pestle or this grinding stone that's something that you need when you have a society that subsists on mainly this grain food like we do with um wheat making our bread and um corn with the tortilla chips we eat we rely mostly on this grain food um here you see a sickle made out of chert so this was used for harvesting so you see a difference in the tools that are being used also in the archaeological record this we 
are would be certain that this comes from an agricultural society. Hunter-gatherer teeth wear, wear mostly flat. If we see a skull with the teeth worn, all the cusps are gone, it's all worn completely flat, we know it was from a hunter-gatherer society. They had coarser food. They um, ate food that would wear their teeth down over their lifetime. Agricultural communities, because we rely on this grain food, our cusps would stay there because it's softer, because we boil it, we cook it in different ways to process it, but because it's so highly starchy, that starch sticks to the teeth and bacteria builds up and we see once we get agriculture, we get a rise in cavities. So we can have much, much larger populations, but we have worse nutrition. We don't have a variety of diets. We also have these cavities. Of course, horticulturalists, our teeth would wear out. But, so it's a trade-off. Different kind of problems come with different kind of subsistence patterns. Okay, so once again, we can have mega cities and standing armies, and that's why I have the picture of um, the Marines there, just to show that we can have these huge populations where we need to defend our land and have standing armies, but we have a decline in dietary quality. So while you can have all the wheat you want or all the corn you want, you could get scurvy and beriberi and these different nutritional deficiency diseases. Um, the food's not as reliable because you have to stay in one place. If it doesn't rain, kaboom, no wheat, you go hungry. So foragers can move around. We can't. Um, foragers have to work 10, 20 hours a week. Horticulturalists work very little too. Agriculture, you get up at dawn, you go to sleep after the sun's gone down, but after you've repaired your equipment, you've made your blankets, it requires a lot more labor. Food storage leads to vermin and pests, pests lead to diseases, you get the point. Of course, we have overcrowding and more people you have tied together and more epidemic diseases you have which is why it's recommended that you stay six feet apart from people you don't know currently. Okay, you don't have class conflict if you don't have class. Once you have agriculture, there's this labor differentiation. There's um, lawyers that have never been on a farm. So you have this class where you have a bureaucratic class, a leadership class, a priest class, and you have many laborers of different type and you have class conflict. Of course, agriculture brings pollution. You have people living in cities where you put their waste. And of course, food production, we tend to eradicate species that we can't currently see as useful. And then, oh wait, that orchid had to cure it all kinds of nasty things. <sighs> Too late now. Okay, greater control over plant resources supports greater number of people. We mentioned that before. They're more stable, they're more sedentary. Instead of that land holding a thousand people, it could hold hundreds of thousands of people. And I just love this picture because it obviously looks like Egypt. And this man is plowing in a color photo, so it's semi-modern, in a way that his ancestors might have done a couple hundred years ago. So it's a really neat picture. I mentioned this before, food surpluses allow for full-time labor specialists in various occupations. So religious specialists, healers, military, police, and such specialization is necessary with increased social and economic complexity. If you need an army, you need people to go around and make sure people are paying their taxes in either food or money. Um, you're going to need roads, you're going to need planners. So there's a lot of complexity that comes with advanced agriculture. In these communities, wealth and power are usually synonymous. There's formal social stratification. 
for the most part, people are born and die in the same class. When we have class, we know that people have the opportunity to move, but in the caste system, it's frozen. Um, religion, in most of these communities, still is usually polytheistic. Um, but it's hierarchical polytheism. In foragers, in horticulturalists, they have multiple supernatural beings, but they're all generally about the same in power. The river and the sun are about the same power as the spirit of the gazelles. You know, it's semi-egalitarian in their spiritual beliefs. If you think of hierarchical polytheistic communities, um, think of Egypt and the Greeks and the Romans and the um, Norse gods. There's a leader god and then mostly important gods and then less important gods and then the spirits. So we see that social complexity reflected in the spiritual world. There's also a tendency towards monotheism, and we don't see monotheism until we get agricultural societies, where we have a God the Father. And there's other spiritual beings. There's still going to be angels and other supernatural entities, but that monotheism is still a controlling God. I said it before. Um, on earth as it is in heaven, but it's whatever is on earth is the way that they see the heavenly. Okay, and one really awesome thing to come out of agricultural societies is writing. Because we needed to keep um, track of taxes, bureaucracy invented ways to record these taxes. Um, we had quipus, um, knotted strings being used to record in, um, Latin America, or what later became Latin America, and, of course, this is cuneiform writing. I think they had, was it base 60 or base 36 writing? So it was a really complex, um, recording system. And they found all these cuneiform tablets, which was really cool. And they worked to interpret them. And it turns out it was kids' math lessons. So that's kind of awesome. Okay, so out of this we also get public works, roads, monumental structures, temples, statuary, pyramids. They all represent centralized political power. And, of course, religious power because you have... You don't need everybody to farm. You have these poor farmers working beyond dusk to dawn. Sorry, beyond dawn to dusk. I've been watching too many vampire films. <laughs> anyway, you have all these p people that are just getting food, which frees up the rest of the population that can do other things, like build pots or be full-time religious specialists praying for everybody. And, of course, we get cities out of it all. And, of course, metallurgy. Um, we get that as a basis for our market economy, and we also get really intense weapons out of it. Oh, yeah, and agricultural tools. We get plows, plowshares, um, better reaping devices. Of course, once we move into monotheistic religions, once we learn we um, move into machines as ways to get most of our food for us, these large families become less important and we move to a nuclear family where the small nuclear family is the, un the main people producing as opposed to the family as a corporate entity working together. Let me just read these words. Emphasis on the individual over the family as a labor unit. A complex system of government and secular law supplants religious beliefs and reflects a worldview and behavioral norms 
that tend more towards individualism, which you don't see in simple agriculture, in horticulture, in pastoralism, and definitely not in foragers. So industrialism is a subsistence pattern based on mechanical rather than biological power. Populations are large with extreme labor specialization. In industrialism, sometimes recognized as a subsistence pattern characterized by a focus on mechanical sources of energy, food production, and only a small percentage of the population actually works in farming. In the United States, I believe it's about 2% now that are still working as farmers. Okay, we're going to call civilization cultures with agricultural surplus, social stratification, labor specialization, and a formal government ruled by power, monumental construction projects, and a system of record keeping. And of course, because we're part of this kind of civilization, we're going to call it civilized. And there's a bit of social Darwinism there in which we tend to see everybody else without these formal governments and social stratification as less civilized. But hunter gatherers never have to worry about being late, they don't get caught in traffic, and they have time to spend with their family and friends. Okay, so there's no better or worse subsistence pattern. It just really depends on what that cultural group needs. If they live in a place where sticking a bit of yucca in the ground and waiting for it to grow works, then it works. If um, following plant herd, or I just said plant herds, if following animal herds or picking food off bushes works, they do it. it. Just whatever that particular group needs in that environment is what subsistence pattern they will have. So have you ever looked at the terraced fields for rice agriculture? These are not natural. This is people working the land to make these rice patties. Aren't they gorgeous? So anyway, agriculture requires a manipulation of the environment and there's greater potential for large populations, but also greater problems. Societies sometimes what we're going through right now is we're throwing away half the food our world is producing right now. Um, there's a TED talk, Tristram, Tristram Stewart. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting his name out. He talks about this food waste and he thinks that one, we should be less wasteful in our production. And two, any surplus we do have, the aftermarket stuff, feed it to, he says pigs, but there's a lot of places don't eat pigs, so goats would work just as well. So you could potentially make less food, and then any food that would be wasted from that less should be fed to animals. It's a really good TED Talk. I highly recommend it to anyone not required to watch it in my class. Okay, and about the market economy versus um, the small um, foraging groups, it wouldn't be called economy, but their way of living. Generalized reciprocity is what we do in families, giving with no expectation of equivalent returns. So you're in a family, you know if you're not able to do something, somebody else in that family will pitch in and do it for you. So you're at home, you're hungry, you don't pay your family to give you food. Well, unless you get to be a certain age and the family's like, okay, we're going to do it this way. But you don't expect to have to pay for your dinner. Or I have this picture of um, young men in basic training here because everybody does what they can to work for the good of the community, of the team. Generalized reciprocity is giving and taking a goods and service without expecting immediate or equivalent return. So forager groups, um, pastoralist groups, 
horticultural group for the most part, they engage in mostly generalized reciprocity. We, on the other hand, work with balanced reciprocity, giving with the expectation of equivalent return. I want food, I pay someone, they cook food, they give it to me. Balanced. Um, I'm working in an office and there's a gift exchange going on and someone gives me a really lovely gold ring and all I got them was a pack of Swiss Miss cocoa and a really lovely mug. I'm not going to feel very comfortable with this exchange. This is not balanced. So you accept on this agreed upon equivalent value. So horticultural systems are moving more towards this. It's still more of a generalized reciprocity because there is more of a family dynamic going on in this small community. But since there is ownership, you're going to see the big man, the big man being a semi-official term. Um, the richest person in the community will give to those who have less. So um, the Quayahoodle potlatch is a way of the most important person redistributing wealth. We redistribute wealth here in our society by taxes. In societies where there's a big man, they redistribute it by they have more, they give away more so then that they have less, so there is more of a balance in society. Money is a symbolic representation of wealth. Wow, profound, huh? <laughs> it's used in exchange for services and products because it's really difficult to bring five sheep when you want a whole bunch of potatoes. So, money. And a market system is where money is used in exchange for goods and services instead of actually bringing the things you want to trade. Okay. This feels out of place here. Sorry about this. But I was talking about um, the Quaihoodle and the big men and the potlatch. That is found in rank societies. It's redistribution used to eliminate differences in wealth. Status is still recognized. There's still the most important person in the community, but because of this giving of blankets, of food, of whatever the surplus item is, their status increases the more they are able to give away. Okay, once again, the redistribution um, helps maintain this semi-egalitarian society, but also increasing the status. We do this in our society redistribution through taxation. Those with more money put into the community good, and those with the least are benefit from those taxes. Well, everybody benefits from those taxes. Class is that here, just read it. A system of socioeconomic stratification in which the strata are open and a person may move to a different stratum. So the poorest can work really, really hard and achieve wealth. The poor are able to move in social class in theory. Of course, most people don't actually change classes during our lifetime, but it's something that's allowable in our society. And if a rich person makes foolish decisions, they may go down and achieve a lower or become lower class. This is opposed to a caste system in which these strata are set from birth and there's no change. It's frozen strata. So if we look at the Egyptians, you're born a pharaoh, you're born a scribe, you're born into into one of these classes and you will always be there. Our society had both class and caste for a while during the um, antebellum period in which the enslaved persons were frozen and were not able to move 
whereas people from the free classes were able to move back and forth between them. And so these are part and parcel of agricultural societies. I just want you guys to think about what this all means. Because once we get agriculture, things do become more and more and more complex. And we'll be talking about that in later weeks. What this subsistence pattern does for religion. What this subsistence pattern does for marriages. So think about this in the following um, couple of days, okay?